Well, thank you, Tony. Um, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I was just reflecting a little bit, I was listening to Tony there, about how um, throughout my professional career I've been involved in a number of uh, changes in structures and what have you. And the thing that always strikes me at the end of the day, though, is it's pretty much the same people, whatever the structure is. Um, and when I actually think about the work we're doing now as a subnational transport body and the work we've got with the Local Enterprise Partnership, there's a lot of old colleagues and friends from regional development agencies, regional assemblies, and it's the same people thinking about the skills and the talents and the experience that are actually applying to the, uh, the challenges we've got. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my background is I'm, I'm a chartered engineer by profession, uh, but I've not designed many bridges or roads for a long time. Um, I've been involved in the sharp end of development control for many years and quite often been told when I was younger I didn't know the first thing about the realities of the uh, uh, economics of development. But more recently, in the last 20 or so years, I've been involved in, let's call it strategic infrastructure planning of one shape or form. So when I had the question... Uh, of uh, what are we going to do, I kind of, I went back to some of my basics. I went back to rule one of transport planning is uh, travel is a derived demand. So surely it's all about housing. But then I think about some of the experiences I've had in the last 20 years and actually there are occasions where transport is the driver. Uh, I'm involved in a project, uh, East West Rail, I've been involved in it for far too many years because it should have been built and delivered 10 years ago, not uh, 7 years in advance. But the point is, you put something like East West Rail in place, you make it possible to go from Oxford to Cambridge direct in an hour and ten minutes rather than through London in two hours and 45 minutes. That is transformational infrastructure. It will have an implication for housing, it will have an implication for people, it will have an implication for the way in which we travel. But even then it's not that simple because this relationship between housing and transport we're missing the fact that things are changing in our lifestyles. If we think about our own personal experiences, how we access services, how we access opportunities. I've sat in an awful lot of debates recently about how we must reinvigorate the town centres. <clears throat> and I'm willing to bet that 90% of the people that evening will go home and order something on Amazon, book their holiday on Expedia, or do something on Topshop or Amazon. You, know, you get the picture. So there is a problem, I think, sometimes for us as professionals. We seem to detach ourselves from the, our own experiences as users of systems, from what we are then advocating as, as people as policies. So it's a complicated system. I'd argue we're also missing one other factor here. It's the economy. Um, right from the start, when England's economic heartland came into being, and it's nearly five years now since the political leaders chose to come together, their driver was they know a successful economy is absolutely essential to a whole range of things within society. Not only does it generate wealth from the businesses themselves, it generates the wealth to support those who need support, those who need opportunities to realise their full potential. So a successful economy is absolutely essential. They understand if you have a successful economy, that brings with it pressures for housing, that brings with it the pressures for more growth. <laughs> But the thing we miss too often is also the issue of productivity. So across the England's economic heartland area, yes, we're one of the most successful parts of the country. Yes, we generate, uh, after London, the biggest uh, next net uh, rate return back to the exchequer. But in terms of our productivity performance relative to the global market, we're still very poor. So we need to think about how investment in infrastructure and services addresses the productivity gap just as much as the gaps in other parts of our infrastructure. And that's where it then starts to play on this relationship between housing and transport. I remember listening to uh, Radio 4 one evening on the way home, and they were talking about a business in Hertfordshire, uh, a small business, uh, very successful, it's a well-known company. Uh, but they had been struggling, they'd been struggling to get their uh, workforce, uh, some of whom were uh, from the rest of the European Union. So it had forced them to think about what they were producing. It had forced them to think about what was their future moving forward. So they reinvented themselves. They reinvented themselves in such a way that the products they were selling were more effective, their productivity went up, their workforce actually went down. Now the reason I say that, we need to be really clear what are we trying to achieve in our decision making. If our decision making is about how do we deliver more houses, you will have one set of choices. If your decision making is about how do we have a successful economy, 
which will have implications for housing, but if your driver is the economy to allow people and businesses to realise their opportunities and their potential, then you may have a different set of outcomes. You may have a different set of choices. And that then reminds me that if we think about change, and we have to do, as Tony was saying, with change, I'd argue that a lot of our change and a lot of our advancement has been through disruption. If I look back over two or three hundred years, the transition from horses to canals, canals to railways, railways to roads, roads to digital, has been as much about the economy driving disruption and our infrastructure having to respond to that as it has been about anything from public sector policy. Why do we have railways? They were created to carry the coal from the coal mines to the factories. Why do we have the Great Western Railway? It was because Brunel had the idea of connecting the London stock market with the New York stock market. He just happened to go along and build a railway, then realised he needed to build some ships, so he designed the ships as well. He had a vision for the future, which was about connecting the economy. So we need to understand about the economy. And I'd argue, I could argue quite easily, I think, that some of the rise of travel applications we have these days on our smartphones are as much about the public choosing um, ways of making their ways of travelling because we have failed them. People choose these travel apps, travel information, because it gives them a service that they otherwise don't have. So you could argue that's a failure in our public policy about how do we actually achieve that. So then if I think about 20 or 30 years ahead, 20 or 30 years, that's three times as long as we've had smartphones there's going to be at least three or four economic cycles in that. We've got things like quantum computers coming in five or ten years. Change is going to be massive and it's going to be disruptive. So if we start thinking about choosing our future based on what we know now and our knowledge of now, the one thing I can guarantee is we will be absolutely wrong. Now, does that mean we leave it all to the market? I, 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 I was hoping Corinne would be here. I know she comes to these things. She would, um, I appeared before Corinne uh, when we did the South East Plan uh, public examination a number of years ago. I do remember, actually, in... Twenty oh, where were we? Oh, Bridget, sorry. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, um, 2026 it runs to. Um, and if you think about some of the issues that we're tackling now, we had Greenbelt release. Yeah. We had all sorts of things. We actually had a coordinated approach to things. So... Am I, I'm not arguing that we leave it to the market because there will always be aspects of creating places where the public sector will have a legitimate role to play in it. And I just make the observation, this isn't the first time I've been involved in, uh, in the regional agenda. This is the third incarnation I've been involved with, uh, with the regions. Uh, I came to uh, the South East when London uh, and the South East Regional Planning Guidance. We did the South East Plan and now we're on the subnational transport bodies. Um, and if I go back far enough, actually... Um, uh, when I was at Devon County Council and we had things called structure plans, I actually helped put two new settlements into the structure plan which are now being delivered. So the point is we do need to think about how we join this up. Um, and it's often um, a moment of sort of uh, reflection when I talk to some of the political leaders that I used to work with in the, uh, the South East uh, Regional Assembly, many of whom are still around. And there's a message for us all. The political leadership at a local and a regional level is a lot more stable and consistent than it is at a national level. There are regrets that we lost an awful lot when we lost the regional spatial strategies. So, in that context, you shouldn't be surprised that five years ago, as I said, um, England's economic heartland came together. This was the political leaders recognising that there are some things where it is of value to work together. There are some projects, East West Road is a good example, where working together collaboratively has produced a, a, a momentum and a support for a major piece of infrastructure. That will have consequences for housing and for the economy. But the level of support for that scheme is something like 85, 90% and more. It's a question of why haven't we built it yet? The leaders bring their authority and their commitment to it. They work collaboratively. It's taken five years to get them to where they are. They've built trust and confidence in themselves. They have relatively light governance. People sometimes worry about the governance, the accountability. If 
11 political leaders with multi-million pound budgets choose to come together every two and a half months to talk about some of the really big strategic issues and they decide to invest in providing the capacity to look at some of those issues, that's a sign of commitment because they understand that delivering a successful economy will actually be important for their uh, future moving forward. Now, I'm not suggesting necessarily a return to the old style regional spatial strategies, much as I regret the passing, because there are aspects of the work we did then, which I would perhaps say on reflection, maybe we need to think differently. One is geography. Um, England's economic heartland has parts of what were four previous regional boundaries but it's a far more practical and logical economic geography. But even then, when we did the South East Plan, we were often looking from an evidence base. We were looking to see what we understood about the here and now. We were starting to use what we knew from now and from the past and think about what it meant for the future. And my observation about the, the more recent times is we started to become aware of the importance of looking to where we want to be, of looking forward rather than looking in the rear view mirror, looking forward. We recently had a, at the CIHT, we had the Learned Society lecture where Professor Glenn Lyons was talking about the power of vision-led scenario planning and the importance of being able to look forward. He talks about it decide and provide rather than predict and provide. And we need to think about that when we move forward. We also need to start thinking now, uh, and it's perhaps topical again after yesterday's announcements, about the implications of some of the things we want to change. I was staggered when I was reading in my Sunday paper, one of my nice guilty pleasures on a Sunday morning is to sit down and read the Sunday papers for about three hours in a coffee shop in Oxford. Um, and I was staggered to see, compared to the last part of the 20th century and now, the average temperature in Oxford is 1.5 degrees C higher. So when the IPCC talks about two degrees and 2030 as being a target to worry about or an issue to worry about, We've got to worry about it now. So doing the here and now, business as usual, is not the way forward. The good news, the good news is that we've got more tools to actually help us. We've got a different range of tools enabled by the use of data, enabled by the use of uh, uh, visualisation, that allow us to explore some of these opportunities. Within England's economic heartland, we're actually, we've assembled quite a powerful toolkit we have a database which actually allows us to understand, for the first time, you might think it's a simple thing, a first time, we have a single database that actually says where all the growth is planned in local plans for the next uh, 20 or so years, combined with a number of other data sets. We have a policy model tool that allows us to explore the future in terms of what would be the different behavioural responses with, by individual people, and actually an ability to backcast if we want to get to 2050 as we do with a zero carbon transport system, what do we do now to get us there in 2050? Because it ain't going to be what we're doing at the moment. We have to make a step change in some way. So we've got the tools. We've got the way of actually in being able to investi uh, investigate this. And we've got a way of engaging with the public in a way that's very different. We've got to get access to and understand and talk with the younger generation, the generation for whom we're planning. Because the one thing I know when I talk to my son is he does not think the way I do. He does not have the same priorities that I have. He doesn't approach transport in the same way that I do. I need him to understand and shape what we're doing moving forward. And there are some good examples. On the left, we've got uh, some work being done in Oxford uh, about vision-led planning. Creating the idea of where do we want to get to. Thinking about what do we want to achieve. Um, I actually want to sort of reflect as well about the importance of going back to the economy, the link with the government's industrial strategy, the four grand challenges around future mobility, AI, clean tech and ageing population are powerful drivers for change in the way we plan and deliver transport infrastructure and services. And more importantly, you get some of those right, you're going to grow the economy and you're going to grow the economy in a way that's actually going to have a positive impact on the environment because clean tech, better use of resources, dealing with AI and artificial intelligence, these are ways of changing the way we will travel into the future. But we can't predict it. We've got to use visions and we've got to use scenario planning to actually get us there. But for me, the one thing we have to address more than anything else, Robbie, I'm looking at you because you've been working with us on this, um, delivery. 
Now, I was involved, as I've mentioned earlier, at the South East Plan, and, and we were involved with the Regional Assembly from the start to finish. Um, and I reflect, it was, almost, it was almost criminal how we lost what we had. We had got to where we had a statutory plan. We actually had, through the regional funding advice, guess what? We were actually aligning the investment on transport, housing and the economy to one single objective. We submitted every year to government our regional funding advice. That fed into government and the Whitehall machinery and we were delivering things to budget, to time. We were actually getting more investment because we were demonstrating a commitment. And when the civil service were worried about the ability of local leaders to um, make decisions and actually prioritise, well, when the leaders in the South East chose to put two and a half years' investment into one project, that was a hell of a political commitment. But they did it, and we got the benefits from it as a, at the end. So where we need to go in terms of delivery is this. We need to strip it back and just understand what is it that actually acts as a barrier. Imagine if you and your community had 2,000 houses at the end of the street. What do you want to know? You want to know the investment in transport is going to be there. You want to know the investment in education is going to be there. You want to know the power is going to be there and the water. Cross England's economic heartland, we are the driest part of the country. Now, that's not a barrier for growth. We just need to be thinking, if we don't address it, if we don't plan for the water investment alongside the transport investment, alongside the digital investment, we're not going to deliver the growth because there will be one part of it which will actually be missing. I was staggered when I was working in Oxfordshire. Bicester, Bicester business areas were complaining about brownouts in electricity supply during the day, during the working week. That's just not acceptable. So this is where the idea of a regionally specific national policy statement for this particular part of the area would be. Establish the need for the major infrastructure. Establish it early and allow it to flow through the system because that kind of infrastructure goes beyond one political cycle, whether nationally or locally. But it's so important. East-West Rail, projects like that are so important, they need to have that commitment beyond the longer term. Make sure we get the alignment. So you have the digital infrastructure alongside East-West Rail. So you have the power supply and the substations being delivered at the same time. You can do it by aligning the regulatory functions that already exist within this framework. And then accelerate delivery. We know that the opportunity to use development consent orders, the industry is comfortable with it, the industry has got experience. Let's use that to actually deliver. So if you start getting that together, you can make some real impact on delivery. And if we can make an impact on delivery, we will take our communities, we will take our businesses with us. So then we, when we are talking about higher levels of economic growth or housing, it comes with the confidence that we collectively, both political leaders and officials, will deliver the infrastructure in the right way at the right time. Now if we do that, I think we can actually make some real progress. It is about the economy, it is about housing, it's about transport, it's about bringing them together. It's about having, if you like, regional spatial strategies 2.0. But it's more than that, it's about shaping the future and recognising that shaping the fusion future requires vision-led scenario planning. It requires us to develop the frameworks that have flexibility but have enough confidence to be able to project to the forwards. And we have to understand it's about collaboration. Structures will not deliver it. Collaboration will deliver it because the private sector needs to work with the public sector. National government needs to work with local government. And that is about collaboration. If we get that right, we can deliver the economic potential, not just of the economic heartland, but of the UK government and the UK generally moving forward. Thank you very much.